Welcome to Sheboygan County Government, working for you. My name is Adam Payne. I'm the Sheboygan County Administrative Coordinator, the co-chairman and county board chairman of uh, Sheboygan County could not be with us today, but our guest is Dale Pauls, the director of the healthcare centers, and today we're going to be talking a little bit about the progress at the healthcare centers. We recently completed our consolidation, and there's been a lot of activity and uh, good news in, re in regards to our healthcare centers. So again, our, our guest is Dale Pauls, and Dale, why don't you start by telling us a little bit about some of the recent activities that's been associated with the consolidation. Well, two of the probably more important ones that led up to the consolidation, of course, were the um, um, dedication and open house and also the, clearing, the closing ceremony at Comprehensive Healthcare Center. On the 23rd of June, we had the uh, dedication and, and open house, which was a beautiful day. We had a lot of attendance and um, a very nice program that included a uh, uh, tribute to Dr. Shaw, uh, the psychiatrist that uh, um, passed away recently. And uh, as I said, we probably had four to 500 people attend and, and tour and, and were very uh, impressed with, with the facilities. To put closure to moving from the Comprehensive Healthcare Center, we also had a ceremony on uh, July 19th in which we had a program um, John Vandermel, a former administrator, really did a nice job in reflecting on the history of the health, uh, Comprehensive Health Care Center. And then um, they uh, opened up the cornerstone, looked at some of the, the items that were put in that uh, back in 1938, which was very interesting. And it was a tribute also to the staff that had worked there many years, uh, a lot of people over 30 years. And, they, they truly enjoyed that. So those were two real important events that occurred just before we consolidated. I had the opportunity, as you know, to participate at both those activities. And you and your staff did a tremendous job planning and, and organizing. And we had good weather for both days, kind of warm, I recall. Yes, yes. I got to MC the, the uh, open house. And I had a blue suit on that day and just about melted. But uh, everyone yes. else did real well. and. I, it was very positive, a lot of compliments about the, the layout and you have had tours and refreshments and you got a lot of positive feedback, didn't you? Yes, we did. It was, uh, it was really exciting to see, um, see people observing and, and making comments about you know, uh, what, what they saw. The closing ceremony at Comprehensive, uh, that was emotional for a number of staff. You've, you've got a 30-year club with some long-time, real dedicated, conscientious employees and just uh, a lot of sentimental feelings, I think, in the air that day. Why don't you talk about that a little bit? Well, what really surprised me too was that there were a lot of former employees that came great distances even to just be able to tour the facility and to, to reflect. And, and uh, there was a lot of camaraderie with, with former and, and existing staff uh, sharing um, moments of, of joy. Uh, and, and the experiences that they had while working there. And I really think it did help um, the staff because that was, a, that was a major change for them moving to a new building and, and, and uh, dealing with, with that. But being able to say goodbye to the building that they'd served so well for many years was, was excellent. And John Man, uh, Vandermeil, as you mentioned earlier, he did a real nice job giving some of the history and and he knows the employees by name and then reference some stories and I thought he set a nice tone and then opening the the cornerstone mm -hmm. what did you find in there well um, some very interesting newspaper articles from from, from the time period um, uh, what was going on um, there were some coins there I believe uh, not really knowing exactly why why they were there but uh, some some interesting yeah. pieces of information for the times. Yeah, great. So we, we've mentioned our open house and the dedication. We've talking, talked about the closing of Comprehensive. What day specifically did the consolidation of Rocky Knoll take place? It occurred on two days, on July 16th and 17th. The first day we moved uh, 34 residents from the ICFMR, and then on the second day we moved the, uh, uh, the remaining uh, 54 residents from the um, the IMD section. 
So how many employees were moved and how was this accomplished? Um, we probably had over 100 employees that moved uh, along with the residents. Well, it goes back to probably a year before where we started planning this, but uh, the coordination of that involved making sure that we had not only our own vehicles, but other vehicles, who was going to be driving those, which residents would be coming. We moved uh, like two times during the day. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we had staff already assigned on the other uh, at Rocky Knoll um, who were there to, to receive the residents when they came. Um, once they got there, there was the plan as far as entertainment was concerned. Uh, while we were continuing to move residents in, the, the whole process of eating and um, a lot of work went into those details to ensure that they they had a, a you know a, a very uh, easy transition that day and or those days and and it happened and I think I misspoke with my earlier question I said how many employees were moved how many residents moved the employees at comprehensive for the most part if it could be facilitated went with the residents yes. did they not so, but how many again how many residents were actually moved within 80, those excuse me 84 84 residents mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and in general, what was the reaction of the residents and their family members? You know, I had the opportunity to be right there when the vehicles pulled up. Uh, and it was very interesting to see those residents and their reactions. A little bit of bewilderment when they first got there, but once they got in the building, they were just really pleased. Uh, smiles and, boy, I, I, I love my room and my, my surroundings. Um, families, I think, had toured earlier and and you know were were very pleased with where their relatives were going to be living. Employees again, they were a little bit um, you know even though they had had some orientation, those first couple days for <laughs> like where am I? Where do I go for this? And so they were feeling their way, but but again very positive uh, about the move. And you touched on that earlier. A lot of planning, a lot of preparation. Uh, Talk a little bit more about some of the steps that were taken to familiarize the residents and their families with their, their new environment. Well, I would say at least two months prior to the consolidation, some of the staff at, at Comprehensive were scheduling tours of the building, both for families and uh, the, the residents. And even going back further, as the construction was occurring, they would bring van loads over and they would ride around the building and, and you know, say, this is where your new home's going to be. So they were continually familiarizing them with, with uh, the surroundings and then um, followed it up with actually touring the facility. I sat in on your, I think, one of your first department head meetings when you had all the, the staff together and after, again, a couple of years of discussions and planning and implementation, uh, I was very pleased to hear all the, the positive comments around the table that employees are, you know, getting to know one another and they were welcomed by the employees that were already at Rocky Knoll and I think one of the staff uh, provided an update that the residents the first evening, some of them may have been a little anxious but very quickly were getting comfortable. Um, what have been some of the, anytime you have a new move like this, there's going to be some some loose ends that need to be taken care of. What are you hearing from your staff? What, what are you working on? Most of those things have to do with the physical plant. Things that may have gotten missed in the construction or once uh, the water is on, there, you know, maybe it's not working just like it, it should be or you know, doors aren't closing quite properly or uh, the bathing complex isn't you know, just exactly the way they want it. So it, it was more that and equipment kinds of um, concerns that they that we had to deal with. Okay. Um, Any concerns from the residents uh, in regards to the facility? Anything that they've raised that you're making some adjustments on? Uh, I don't think so, Adam. Really, um, some of the some of the residents, as far as where we would like have them go outside, we had to kind of acclimate them to that, and mm -hmm. uh, but. What I hear from resident council meetings that we've had just, just recently, not any real major concerns being expressed. And you mentioned that's a good segue, resident council meetings, that, that the importance of that communication. And you've taken proactive efforts to make sure the community is aware of uh, what's happening. You were here in May 
uh, providing an update on TV8 and you have a newsletter. What, what are some of the steps that you've taken in the past and that you're going to continue to do to keep the community and public aware of the steps that are going on out there? As you mentioned, the, the newsletter uh, called The Connection, that, that or at least a, a form of that will continue to, to make people in the community aware of, of, of what the ongoing things are uh, happening at, at the health care centers. Uh, we have in the past visited the, some of the, the service clubs and, and I would plan to continue to do that in uh, any other uh, uh, types of uh, community uh, uh, meetings that, that we can make them aware. Resident council, family council, I think we, we, we want to work on that a little bit where uh, family members are you know, uh, certainly aware of, of uh, what's happening with the residents. So the consolidation, on one hand, people may say is done. But on the other hand, there's a lot of work ahead of us. Um, give, give our viewers a sense of you know, what is ahead of us. It isn't. Let me back up. How much was the consolidation? How much did the project cost? It, it uh, was approximately $8.9 million. $8.9 million. And where are we at with the budget overall? Well, we came in right around 800000 under budget. Under budget. And from this point forward, what do you see as some of the challenges with uh, acclimating the residents and working with staff? Uh, what's ahead of us? Well, we, I think we have to look at um, it's still having to consolidate Rocky Knoll staff with Comprehensive on a number of projects because we've got departments that came over separately, like the activities department um, and uh, like social services. So the, we'll be working on merging those together and, and uh, so that the staff uh, you know, have a better idea of their assignments as a, as a consolidated staff. Looking at the table of organization, are you seeing areas for adjustments? As you said, folks have moved from comprehensive to Rocky Knoll or comprehensive to Sunny Ridge. Are you making any uh, changes in that area? Yes. Uh, obviously, there are positions that you don't need two of. You don't need two directors of nurses. You don't need two food service supervisors. A number of those positions which uh, we have consolidated into one. And um, as far as the, the direct care staff, we're looking at uh, areas there as far as how we can be more efficient and um, utilize them uh, in, in a best as and, we can. And speaking of efficiencies, uh, some of our viewers may be wondering, well, after it's all said and done, we're consolidated, what kind of savings have we picked up in operations? Dale and I just met this morning to review the budget, the preliminary budget for the health care centers. What are, you, what are you seeing at this point? Well, it looks like we will be, you know, very close to a million dollars in, in, in savings there. In operations. In, in, in operations as far as the, the very consolidation. Good. Very good. And, and I guess I would say that I feel like that this is still going to be ongoing. During the next year, we will be continuing to evaluate, and I, and I, I think we will see probably more changes forthcoming. And Comprehensive, that grand old building, what's happening with Comprehensive? Right now, we're in the process of advertising that through uh, Remax. Uh, Bill Kane, the realtor, has been uh, engaged to do that, to advertise it na nationwide. Um, we're also uh, getting rid of furniture, equipment within the building, either through our own departments or the, the county departments, and hopefully we'll open it up to um, municipalities and other nonprofit organizations to uh, see if there are items that they're interested in. So if any of our viewers are watching this and interested in uh, what happens with the property or the possibility of picking up some furniture for a town hall or a nonprofit, who would they contact? Bernie Romer, who is a purchasing agent for Sheboygan County. Okay, very good. When we were in the midst of discussing the consolidation and prior to the county board making a decision on just how far we can go, uh, we had uh, too many open beds, that was a concern. And a concern from the community is, do we have enough beds? 
how many licensed beds do we now have between Rocky Knoll and Sunny Ridge? We have 514 total beds. Now, when we started this whole downsizing, we had 717. So we've, we've reduced by 203 beds. At Rocky Knoll, we'll have 195 total beds. And then at Sunny Ridge, we have um, 319. We're not at capacity at either of the buildings right now. And I, I really feel that we're, we're very close to uh, the capacity that we need. There may be situations where Rocky Knoll might not have a bed, but Sunny Ridge would. And, and I think we have to realize that that, that can occur and it may only be for a short time if, if a person vice versa would, would like to be in the, the other facility. But as far as the toll beds for um, our operations, I think uh, we're very close to the need now and, and, and going forward in the future. More and more uh, alternate types of care are being provided out there that help to minimize the, you know, the, the concern about um, the number of people that are, are going to need nursing home care in the future. So uh, I think it stabilizes and, and uh, I'm comfortable with the number that we have at the health care centers. So uh, you said 514? Yes. Licensed beds, and in both Rocky Knoll and Sunny Ridge, we're not at capacity at present. Yes, that's correct. Now, of course, at Rocky Knoll, we've got different types of clients, and in some parts, we may be at capacity. Uh, what was originally in the Rocky Knoll uh, side has 99 beds, and, and we're virtually full there. Uh, 99 for skilled care? Yes. Okay. And then. And since you raised that, what are the other areas of Rocky Knoll? There's been comments made uh, on a regular basis that it's now one of the state-of-the-art facilities in the nation. And you've got to be proud of that fact. What types of uh, care can be provided there? As well as the skilled nursing facil uh, facility residents, as you mentioned, um, the uh, intermediate, excuse me, intermediate care facility for the mentally retarded, mm -hmm. uh, 37 beds to provide services for them, and then for the mentally ill, another 59 beds. And with that, those beds, I had mentioned that, you know, those are all private rooms, um, which we've found already to be advantageous for them. Excellent. Uh, and at Sunny Ridge, that's primarily a skilled care facility, though you do have one wing for dementia, Alzheimer? Yes, yes. And I, I should have mentioned for Rocky Knoll, we now have a 16-bed dedicated unit strictly for dementia. Um, so that's a, you know, a, a service that we hadn't provided in, a, in that way before. At Sunny Ridge, we have one floor that isn't at this point being utilized at all. Isn't, that, isn't the sixth floor there vacant? Yes. So when we talk about the future, you mentioned that we feel that our capacity right now is uh, very manageable, that we have room for growth. What is your sense about the long-term care needs for residents in Sheboygan County? Well, when we talk long-term, it, it all depends. So the way things ha happen in healthcare today, you can't go out but probably more than five years and then you call that long-term. And I guess I'm saying that really with the number of beds we have currently, I think we're, we're um, within the needs as far as meeting the needs. Um, we will look for other alternative uses for that, that sixth floor. Um, I haven't been able to really delve into that as much as I uh, hope to, but um, we will be in the near future. If you look beyond five years, maybe there will be a need and they're there and we, we could, uh, who knows, the. Uh, their freeze on uh, licensed beds may be lifted and, and, and then we would be able to increase licensure if we needed to. So if we did see a spike that wasn't anticipated, we have uh, an entire floor that's open and vacant and we have some flexibility. Yes. yes. Let's talk a little bit about the funding. Healthcare centers in general across not only the state but the nation have been struggling and people, I'm sure our viewers have read from time to time reports about how nursing homes are closing are really struggling. Uh, how is the Sheboygan County Healthcare Center doing and, and what are some of the uh, revenue sources? 
We have a number of revenue sources. The largest revenue source comes from medical assistance, which is for those that cannot pay their own way. We have probably about 75% of our, our resident population. Then we have a Medicare population that's between two and 5%. That would be people that are in the hospital that need, once they come out of the hospital, they need some types of therapies. Um, and that's a, a revolving population because, and it's a positive one because we rehabilitate and they're able to go back to the community. Along with that then we would have a small smattering of uh, hospice, uh, veterans administration, and I guess I did, um, didn't mention those people that are able to pay um, for, their, for their care. And that makes up about 20 percent. Now, when we talk about the medical assistance patients, currently what we receive for their levels of care doesn't meet our costs. And so we're participating in an uh, intergovernmental transfer program that allows additional monies to make up the difference between um, what they're paying and what, what it's costing. Now let me stop you there because some of our viewers are, once we get into the financial matters, it can be tough to follow this intergovernmental transfer program number of our viewers may have read in the paper that the county's been participating in a wire transfer and in fact we're looking at doing our fourth wire transfer and this is a means of getting additional financial dollars from the federal le level of government to the state which is passed on to the county and other nursing homes. Uh, there hasn't been a lot of comfort level with the mechanism but it certainly has helped Sheboygan County and nursing homes across the state and offset what we'd be otherwise paying in property taxes. Why don't you explain a little bit just how helpful that has been? It has, you know, basically covered the losses that we would have incurred. And I, the, what we're concerned about is what the, the future of that will be. Um, there are projections that um, that is no longer going to be in existence after so many years and so that's why we have to at this point be looking at uh, what other avenues we have to to offset those differences but in the in the past it's been able to cover like 100 percent of what maybe the different in our our nursing care you know as far as what the what what's costing us and what, what we're being reimbursed we were always receiving some Medicaid dollars, but by participating in the intergovernmental transfer program, I believe we picked up about a 2.7 million additional dollars. We have budgeted about 5.5 for this year. And as you said, we're hearing from the federal government, the state government, that that may start dropping significantly. And if that happens, once again, we're gonna really be challenged with how we come up with new revenue sources to cover that reduction of federal or state aid. Um, have you considered what we might do, Dale? What are, what, what are some of the thoughts that you've had in that regards? Well, obviously we have to operate as efficiently as we possibly can. As long as the mission is to care for the, the, the current population and the, and the two buildings that we have, we have to be as fiscally responsible as we can. We also maybe have to look at what other revenue sources possibly could be out there. Um, I do think that the Medicare segment, we hope to be able to increase that activity and in turn increase the number of residents we have and, and, and uh, that be a, a larger revenue source for us. So when we talk about reimbursement and, and maintaining revenue streams, what do you see as the biggest challenge in the, in the future? for operating our health care centers? Well, it definitely is. Where are we going to receive the dollars to, to pay for the services? Yeah. But in addition to that, staffing is a, is a concern for the future. As we look at health care workers, and I think the audience would um, have seen a number of articles about shortages of RNs and LPNs and, and certified nursing assistants, we need to be very concerned about that going forward so that we have adequate staff to care for our people. Do you have any plans in place or strategies that you're considering with your management team to address those issues? We've utilized a number of things in the 
in the past. We do have like tuition reimbursement program available to those who may want to move from a CNA to an RN or an LPN program. We have people participating in that and in fact we've had a couple staff that have completed their program so they've been able to come back and, and uh, help us with shortages there. We're currently involved with uh, the uh, can't think of the program, LTC's program mm -hmm. in regards to CNA, uh, number of classes going on so that we have available people that uh, may want to work for us. Um, we're a part of a, a consortium of healthcare providers that are working on recruitment techniques, working on educating and getting people interested in, in the healthcare field. So there's a number of things that, that uh, in that area that we're working on. Good, good. Well, Dale, I wanna thank you for being our guest today and giving our viewers an update on what's happening at Rocky Knoll and Sunny Ridge and uh, the closing of the Comprehensive Healthcare Center. Certainly appreciate your efforts and those of your staff. It's been a real roller coaster ride the last few years on this issue, not only for uh, those of us working for the county, but the public, and it's really heartwarming that as things have come together, it's been so positive based on, again, reports directly from the residents that we serve and their family members. So I thank you, and I thank your staff. Thank you. Next month, our guest will be Shannon Hayden. She is the new planning director for our planning and resources department, and we're looking forward to hearing from Shannon and about a number of the programs in our planning and resources department. That's about a $1.3 million department. Uh, there's some new initiatives, as many viewers know, with uh, stewardship and natural resource protection, as well as ongoing initiatives with, uh, through the legislature on uh, code and rule updates on septic systems, what have you. So we're gonna have Shannon as our guest and look forward to talking to her about our planning and resources department. So on behalf of County Board Chairman Dan Lemieux, on behalf of the County Board, Thank you for joining us today.